Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 611. What is the optimal blood level for testosterone in women? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to answer a question that I'm always asked in my office when I am offering pellets that contain estrogen and testosterone or just testosterone to women. They always ask me, so you do this blood and what level are you looking for that says that my pellets are at the right blood level? And I have to give them a very complicated answer. Uh, There is a simpler answer. It's a range of of blood levels. And I say, I have a range that I'm looking for that says that you're adequately treated, but it's between 15 free testosterone and 45. That's a big range. So why the big range? Well, this is why people don't do pellets, is because, first of all, every patient is different. I can't just go, oh, yeah, the the dose of Keflex is 500 or 250 for everybody. No matter how big they are, no matter how old they are, no matter how young they are, (laughs) those are the doses. I can remember all of that. But for pellets, uh, estrogen and testosterone levels have to be in a range that actually removes the symptoms of testosterone deficiency from a particular woman. And the reason I do blood levels, even though there's this wide range, is because I want to know what the level is for a particular patient that I'm shooting for every time. When I get to a blood level at the three-month mark after her pellets, where she comes in and says to me, that was it, all my symptoms are gone. And I have to go through all the symptoms to make sure that all her symptoms are gone. When she says that, then I know I hit the right blood level. Then I look at the right bl- at the blood level. Say it's twenty. Okay, well that that is that particular person's perfect blood level at three months. Now, you have to understand that pellets aren't like pills. Pills are dosed so that they go up during the day and go down every day, so that you you have the whole dose of that one pill throughout the day, keeping you at a certain blood level which they don't usually tell you what that blood level is. However, then the next day you dose again, the next day you dose again. Uh, That has worked for many medications, but for hormones, honestly, that's not working because that means you feel great at noon, but you feel lousy at 9 o'clock at night if you were taking a hormone that went up and down every single day. So your hormones were very complicated. When you were young, they were managed perfectly by your pituitary gland and your blood uh, blood levels uh, went to your pituitary gland in your brain, and they then determined how much stimulation your ovaries got to then make more either testosterone or estrogen. It was like a very complicated orchestra, and it is not possible for me to make that particular orchestra happen after menopause or after 40. The ovaries start to get resistant to the, uh, t- to the uh, orchestration. They don't respond normally, and they don't make enough testosterone, and then usually they make too much estrogen. Then at some point, they stop making both, and that's menopause. After that, there is no orchestration from the pituitary gland. All the pituitary gland does is continue to increase two hormones called FSH and LH. They go up, they go up, and they go up, and every time they go up, they give you hot flashes, night sweats, maybe even anxiety as they surge through the night, and they mess up your sleep. You don't get restful sleep, and that wears on you. It's kind of like, you know, being in a a prison of your own body and and, uh, 
none of the other inmates will let you sleep. They're always banging on the banging on their bars and waking you up. That's what it feels like when you're always waking up throughout the night. You don't get a restful sleep, and we need sleep, at least seven hours of sleep a night. So um, there is a specialist named Rebecca Glazer, and she publishes articles in, in the journal called Maturitis. And in 2013, which seems like a while ago, but she did a lot of research before this, she um, stated that there is no one blood level for testosterone pellets that she uses to guide her treatment. She said the minute a patient says, my symptoms are all better, and she goes just by symptoms, basically, my symptoms are gone, then she says that's the, that's the dose of the pellets that you need. And that's what she sticks with in general. Now things change, and she may have to change them along with symptom, symptoms coming back, for different reasons. There's a lot of different things that affect your hormones. When I have a patient that comes to me, um, they usually have, you know, a free testosterone level of one or two. And physiologically, when they're young, they should be somewhere over seven. I'm trying to get them back to that young level where their free testosterone was healthy and where they had enough free testosterone to basically have good sexual function, to have a good sex drive, to not be anxious, no hot flashes, to have uh, plenty of energy, plenty of muscle mass, good thinking, no, no um, uh, migraine headaches, not, they don't have arthritis, they don't have autoimmune diseases. I mean, when we're young, we don't have this stuff. This stuff happens when we're older. And this, most of these things that I've just mentioned start with the loss of testosterone. So, um, when we are young, we don't worry about it. We don't even know this is coming. No one even tells us. It just happens, and then they say, oh, you're just getting old. Well, you may be 40. That's not very old when you live to 100 or 90. So just to get rid of our symptoms, we have to replace our testosterone and, and as, as our estrogen as well. Uh, but to pre prevent the diseases of aging, which we talked about it in other health casts, we also have to replace our estrogen and replace our testosterone because we're not going to escape those without those hormones. It makes all the other treatments we do possible. So replacing hormones after um, you lose them is the primary way we lay a foundation for then changing your lifestyle, addressing other hormonal and, and uh, di diabetic medical issues. So, so this is... Um, the symptoms that I look at are also on page five and six of my book, um, uh, Testosterone, the, the Secret Female Hormone. Actually, it's the secret female hormone, testosterone, uh, can save your life. So um, page five and six lists all of these symptoms, and I'm listing them as well here. If you have these symptoms, and you have at least three of them, and you're in the age group, uh, or you've had your ovaries out earlier than 40, then you need to have your hormones replaced in a way that they don't go up and down every day because that'll make you feel awful, but that they go up like pellets do. We put pellets in your hip fat. They dissolve in the fat. They then slowly release testosterone and estrogen so that you get a pretty constant blood level of testosterone and estrogen at all times. And the only thing that can increase that is exercise or a faster heart rate that can use up your testosterone faster or make it make it be distributed from the pellet faster. Um, another thing that it can be peculiar to a patient is that some patients have very inactive fat. Their fat doesn't have a lot of enzymes. They've probably had the fat there. They haven't gone up and down <laughs> in dieting. They've had the fat there. It's been inactive for years, and we put pellets in there, and that type of fat takes a while to actually absorb the testosterone and actually get it into your bloodstream. But once it's there and once it's absorbing, then we get a constant level. Another thing that changes your free testosterone level is how fast your liver breaks it down. Because the liver in everybody is a little different. It's different genetically. It's different because of the things we eat and drink. It's different because of things we've done to ourselves when we were young, 
um, in terms of drugs and um, infections like hepatitis. And I mean, not that's a that's an infection, but some of the things like alcohol or over imbibing. Some of these things have all affected the liver function and how it breaks hormones down. So some women break down their estrogen really fast, but don't break down their testosterone really fast and vice versa. So every woman breaks it down in a different way. So that's very individual. And we have to, we have patients come in and say, you know, my pellets were gone and I was great. And then pellets were gone and um, two and a half months. So we have to think about how to make the pellets last longer, yet give her the same relief that she had in the very beginning. And that either takes changing the size of the pellets, and sometimes that doesn't even work, and sometimes pe people have to come in more often, like every three months. That's unusual. Some people, as they get older, that can come in less frequently, more like four and a half or five months. And that's because their liver is not working quite as fast and uh, their fat may not be even absorbing it as quickly. But as long as their symptoms are gone, then I still have the right dose. I just need to change my dosing time. But pellets are a little dicey to think about. If you just think very, very um, black and white, you're a doctor that just memorizes dosages, you're not going to be somebody who wants to do pellets. To, for their patients, because you can't think like that. You have to think in time, dissolving, the time it takes to dissolve, the time it takes to get into the bloodstream, the things that can affect the actual blood level of free testosterone, the active part of the testosterone, and then we have to think about how, how fast or all the things that can make the liver break it down faster. More, more drugs. If you take a whole list of drugs, you're going to need more testosterone because it gets broken down faster. All those drugs are speeding up the enzyme function of breakdown for, for your pellets. If, um, if you, your uh, liver is abnormal or you've had hepatitis or you've damaged your liver in some way, it's going to slow getting the testosterone and estrogen out of your body. Uh, so that's at the end point of the pellets and the beginning of the p beginning point where it's dissolving in the fat. Then, um, then I have patients that, and everyone has this sometimes, sometimes they're really stressed and their cortisol goes up really high. And when it does, then they make uh, cort uh, cortisol binding protein. That also inactivates some of the testosterone. So the more stressed you are, oftentimes you need your testosterone, but it is binding it up and lowering the active amount of testosterone that you have. There's a, a hormone called sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin is a protein from your liver that um, when you have a high testosterone level, the sex hormone binding globulin goes down, which means that you have a higher free testosterone. When we add estrogen to testosterone treatment, it increases the sex hormone binding globulin and decreases the amount of free testosterone. Then, just to add a little fun, some of the patients I've gotten from around the country um, who, whose doctors couldn't figure this out, they have a very high sex hormone binding globulin for no reason at all. They're not stressed. Their cortisol is low. They don't have a high estrogen. and But they're binding up all their testosterone. It is... It is a ge genetic thing that they have. They make a lot of this particular binding protein. And um, some of the time we see this in athletes who have very little body fat and who exercise to extreme. They make a lot of sex hormone binding globulin. It binds up both estrogen and testosterone. And then they have a, their bloodstream is like, is carrying very little of either hormone, and they may even get hot flashes, or it, it makes them feel, you know, they get osteoporosis because they don't have any estrogen or testosterone. So oftentimes that happens because of overexercise. So we have to find out from these patients very specific things about their life that could be impacting their free testosterone level. Because remember, you make this much testosterone, but only a tiny little slice of that pie actually works. The rest of it is bound up and doesn't work at all. 
So if you have a higher sex hormone binding globulin, that little bit is going up to almost nothing. So in those folks, we usually try to increase testosterone, but they miss their estrogen. So we give them estrogen, then that increases their sex hormone binding globulin, and they don't feel their testosterone. It's, it's like every time they come in, we have to rebalance them. And it requires blood work all the time, and it requires a lot of work on the part of the patient and me or my nurse practitioners, or Dr. Sullivan. So those are the things that can affect your blood level, and it's unlike any other drug that we use. I mean, I don't know of another drug or medication or treatment that you have to have a, a particular blood level per patient, and that actually is their level, but you've got to get there so many different ways. You can't just give them a 50 milligram dose of blank and have it work. It doesn't work like that. So this requires a lot of training and a lot of experience. That's just part of what we do. Well, Dr. Sullivan and I, I view that as a challenge, which is a good challenge that we can figure out puzzles in patients' metabolism that maybe other folks can't figure out and get them better when they've already gone to five or six doctors. We, we like the challenge of being able to do that, and we do it all the time, frequently. So the, um, so that blood level that we get in your blood determines then what your maintenance dose is, what your dose of testosterone and estrogen will be for the next year. And at any point in time, something may change in your metabolism, a new drug you take, a new activity that you have, where we have to go step back, get more blood work, and figure out why you're using it up faster, not using it up as fast, why, why certain, cer you're getting certain symptoms that come back. And we have to always go back to symptoms and say, which symptoms came back and when did they come back? Because it's not just, oh, they came back. When, did they come back at the very beginning when we uh, dosed you the way you've always been dosed? Or did they come back at the very end? Did you just run out of your hormone? Or was there something going on with how your hormones metabolized that caused you to have a low level at the very beginning? Sounds complicated? It is. It's really, when I've explained this to some other doctors, they kind of look at me like, better you than me. <laughs> they don't, and they don't um, ever want to do this. But luckily, We've had very good luck with our nurse practitioners being able to learn this and learn how to deal with this. So um, when Dr. Glazer does a lot about uh, or writes a lot about testosterone implants and she describes all the different things that are wrong with just following blood levels and never talking to your patient about what symptoms come back. And, she, and there, are many, there are many variables that... Um, that, that can skew the results of the blood work, which is why she doesn't use them as her primary way to manage the dosage. And one of them is sometimes free testosterone levels are hard, hard to actually uh, get in a lab, actually study, actually get the right result, and sometimes they're not right. Sometimes we send people back to the lab for a second test just to see if it's so far off that we just can't believe that that's real. Um, but uh, no single blood test actually, this is her, her study, actually represents exactly what the patient feels during the day. Because if you're exercising, you're going to feel more testosterone. If you're sedentary and quiet and sleeping, you're not going to have as much. It has to do with how fast the blood flows past the pellets and picks up testosterone. So uh, those two things uh, make the blood tests not a good way to... Uh, measure testosterone. The metabolic activity of your fat is another problem, and I described that earlier. One I didn't describe is there's a difference in how your tissues all over your body, every cell that is affected by testosterone, how it actually accepts the hormone. So it's one thing to have a hormone that is active, not bound up and inactivated, but active in your blood. It's another thing as to how your genetically determined receptor site on every single cell actually accepts that testosterone. 
believe it or not, some people are resistant. In other words, even though there's a receptor site there and it's open and it should be accepting testosterone, it just may be not doing that. It's closed for something. <laughs> it's, it's, it's closed for lunch. Anyway, so some people are resistant to a certain testosterone level. And so they actually need more to actually flood the, the receptor sites. Some people are very sensitive and they don't need a very high blood level of testosterone to relieve them of all the symptoms that testosterone deficiency can cause. So the, um, the last thing is one of the biggies and one that's very hard to deal with for a lot of doctors, and that is that um, estrogen, the more estrogen I give, the less free testosterone there is. So if I increase an estrogen level, I'm almost it's almost necessary to increase the testosterone level to actually um, give you the same free testosterone blood level that you had with the lower estrogen level. So there's different symptoms for low estrogen than low testosterone. We talked to you about those symptoms, which ones are coming back, which, which don't come back. How do we deal with this? And um, when we increase your estrogen, we almost have to always increase your, free te your testosterone to keep the free testosterone level even. We have to think about that. So they affect one another. If I give you cortisol or cortisone, or if you take steroids for something that's unrelated, that can completely wipe out your free testosterone. You're, you won't even feel it. It'll fill all the receptors and block your testosterone, and you won't feel your testosterone. It doesn't mean you don't take it if you're dying. <laughs> if, you need your, if you need a steroid, and in your, uh, it's usually not a problem in your joints. But if you need a steroid for something else throughout your body, you need a steroid. You have to take it. But it's very possible that for a period of time, and everybody's different, you won't feel the good part of your testosterone because it can't hook into the, into the receptor sites. So all of these things affect the testosterone level that is perfect for you. And how we dose it is based more on your symptoms than it is on just a blood level of testosterone. Yes, we still take blood levels. We need them to see how everything's working together, but we make our decisions based on the symptoms that you're telling us are coming back or are still not there. If your estrogen's low and you have no low estrogen symptoms and your FSH and LH are low, I don't increase your estrogen. You don't, I don't do it by the numbers, and same with testosterone. So this is what my patients ask me. What's the perfect level of free testosterone for me? Well, it's different for everybody. And that's part of the challenge about managing patients with testosterone and estrogen pellets. But it's what makes it um, so worthwhile when we can treat people who nobody else can treat. So thank you for listening. Please um, join us for next week's uh, HealthCast and join us in our office if you need help with this particular problem. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.